Moana Safiwe. Moana Safiwe Sana. Asante, you may be seated. Let's appreciate our worship team and the band. Are they incredible or what? I just love it. Thank you so much. Wow, what an honor and a privilege it is to be with you this morning. Good morning. Habari ya asabui. Yeah, it's okay. It's okay. Um, my name is Reverend Rhonda Clark, and this is my handsome husband, Dr. Ron Clark. And we want to welcome all of you to our main sanctuary and to Deliverance Church International, Kasarani Zimmerman. And we pray that you make this your church, as Dr. Ron and I have. We just love it here. If you're also following us on social media or any platform, we ask that you type in the comment section, amen, and let us know where you're following us from. We would love to pray for you, put in any prayer requests you have. There is an incredible prayer team in this church, and I know that they would love the opportunity to pray for you. So keep up with those prayer warriors. We love you all. Thank you. Dr. Ron and I have now been in Kenya for the past 10 years, helping the Maasai and the Samburu peoples in any way that we can. Dr. Ron serves as the president and CEO of the Maasai Trust, and he's working tirelessly to make a difference in the lives of those who are marginalized or who just need our help to get things that they do not have and help that they desperately need. But you can follow us online at the Maasai Trust, M-A-A-S-A-I Trust.org, all one word, the Maasai Trust.org. Look us up, follow us along, and contribute a, a shilling or two if you have. We would love to be able to have that. So Asante Sana, we thank you so much for your help. We would also like to acknowledge someone who is with us today and who has been with us for almost 10 years, Boniface Bolimo, can you stand up? He is in training to become a pastor with us. He is also an associate of the Maasai Trust and our right-hand man. I don't know what we would do without him. Thank you for being here, he truly is part of the family, a man of God, and ladies, he's single. <laughs> no, 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 no. You don't want him taken away. No, 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 no. <laughs> Can we just appreciate him? Thank you so much. Boni, we love you. Buona Sofiwe. Um, we also know that, that Bishop Jimmy and, and Mama Sita Alice are on their way home, so we pray for traveling mercies with them. So we appreciate them giving us the opportunity to speak from this platform today. I know that Dr. Ron has an incredible word for us. And so it is my honor to introduce to you the speaker of today, my handsome husband, Dr. Ron Clark, who has been in the ministry for 45 years. Can you believe that? Incredible. He has embarked on 11 years of post-high school education by receiving his bachelor's degree in education, his master's degree in theology, his doctorate degree of ministry from Oral Roberts University, and his PhD in organizational management from the Aden University. So I, he was only one of six pastors that were prayed specifically, ordained by Brother Oral Roberts, to carry on the year 2000, to carry on the healing ministry. So what an honor that is. For those of you that know Brother Oral Roberts, that's an incredible honor. So we appreciate that. So as he prepares to give um, the word today, I want to read this initial scripture, and it's gonna be in the New King James Version. And it's 2 Corinthians 9, six through eight. Okay, let's read it together. We can, good. The Apostle Paul writes in his fourth letter to the Corinthians, but remember this, New King James Version, good. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart, not grudgingly or of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. Tell your neighbor, God loves a cheerful giver. Amen. And so 
And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that you, always having all sufficiency in all things, may have an abundance for every good work. Amen? Let's all reach our hands towards Dr. Ron and let's pray over him today for the word. Heavenly Father, we come before you today with hearts full of gratitude for your countless blessings. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together today as a church family and to hear your word. Lord, as we lift up my husband and as he prepares to deliver this sermon, we ask that you anoint his words, give him clarity of thought, and fill him with your Holy Spirit. May he speak with wisdom, power, and of love. Father, we also pray for our church congregation for opening our hearts and minds to receive the revelation of your financial principles of giving. Help us to understand the joy and the blessings that come from generous contributions. May your word take root in our hearts and transform our lives. We ask that you pour out your grace upon us that we may give cheerfully and generously, trusting in your promise to provide for all of our needs according to your word in Philippians 4.19 that says, and my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We are praying for traveling mercies for Bishop Jimmy and Pastor Alice as they return from their trip this week. May they come back safely refreshed and renewed. Bless our time together and may it bring glory and honor to you. It's in Jesus' mighty name we pray and all God's people said, amen. Let's welcome our speaker, Dr. Ron Clark. Asante. You know, I don't think I'll ever stop preaching so that I can get so many kisses. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I want to encourage you men to kiss your wives more. No, I want to encourage you men, and this is not the message, but I feel like I need to say this. It, it was a, prompted in my spirit as Rhonda uh, prayed that, you know, Jesus said, love your wife as he loves the church. And can you think of any greater love than that of what our Lord has for this church and for every church member? He loves you. And not an amen in the house. Can we say amen that Jesus loves us? You know, he's quick to forgive us. If you're a widow or a widower or single, you think you're laying in that bed alone at night, but Jesus is always there with you. He loves you. He'll never leave you or forsake you. You may be at the bottom of your financial resources and God has a blessing in store for you. He's going to treat you just like he treats the church. Amen. And your husband is going to love all that loving and kissing. Amen. Amen. I could not do the work that I do without Rhonda. She's as much a part of this ministry as as, uh, as I am, and uh, keep us in your prayer. The, uh, just to give you a quick update, um, you know, the, the, the government does not have, because the Messiah lives so remotely, there is no, uh, it's a long way from a, a Messiah village to government services. So many times they receive very little in the form of government services. Like Basil, you know, there's 6,000 people live in Basil. There's one clinic with one uh, health officer. Can you imagine? For 6,000 people. So the, the Messiah need help. Uh, you don't know it. You, you, you live in a neighborhood that you can, you can buy a piece of bread or or something right, right there, probably next to your house. There are no stores out there. You, you, can, you can walk 
100 kilometers not see anybody, uh, wild animals. And it takes a lot to catch a wild animal and turn him into a hamburger. So pray for them. Um, the last report that I have received is since 2019 and the drought of the burning sun, which is what they call this current season that they're in. It's the worst drought they've had in 100 years. Where we're having rain here, they don't have it. They don't have anything. It's just as dry as can be. And when they do get rain, it seems like in the last two years, it's always flash flooding where water is up to this high in their homes. Uh, that, and then comes disease and all those things. And we have lost 146,000 Maasai since 2019. That means that in 2019, when you took your, your census, there was 101.2 million Maasai. Now there's a little over 770,000. At this rate, by 19, or by 2050, there will not be any more Maasai left in Kenya. So we need to pray. And this is why at 68, God has me here and not retired in home or doing something else. He has me here using my faith, doing everything I can to try to help these precious people. They're precious, amen? And the whole world likes to come to see them. They don't come to see the Mijikandas or the Kukuyus or the Kambas or the Kissis or the Tessos or the the Luyas, well, maybe they'll see a Luya. Luya, won't they, Boney? A few may come out to see a Luya, but they, uh, the, the Luels, the, 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 their interest, the world's interest is in the Messiah's commitment to their old way of life. And then they always come to see the animals. So it's very important for you that, that the Messiah make it. They're 12% of your gross national product. So if you lose the Maasai, you lose 12%, and that means this country will fall into a depression like you have never known in your history. So it's important that we pray. So I just ask you, if you can give, that's fine, but I, I really ask you to pray for the Maasai people. Amen? Amen. How many have ever heard that uh, money is evil? There's a scripture that says money is the root of all evil, or all forms of evil. How many of you have ever heard that scripture? Do you know why money is evil? It's because the people that have it are evil. Money itself is like a tool. It, it, it only does what the craftsman that has it makes it do. A hammer is, is, is useless without somebody to, to swing it. And money in itself is not evil, but it will locate what's in your heart. Amen? The scripture says in the book of Matthew chapter 6 and verse 21, and you men don't have this up there, but I'm going to read it anyway. It says, for where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. And I, I hear people tell me how much they love their church. And I, I, sometimes I'm, I'm tempted, but I, I, I wouldn't do it, but I'm tempted uh, to ask them, let me see your M-Pesa. Let, let, me, let, let, me let me see how much you give to your church. Because if you love your church as much as you say you love your church, then your money will be in the church. Amen. Listen, if you stay quiet, I'm going to preach till three this afternoon. It's the amens that get me through this. So you've got to say amen. If you believe it, say amen. amen. Now, your bishop, one of the best friends of my life in, in, in the whole world, he and I are, 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 are friends and I love him with all of my heart. And I'm in this church because of my love for him and Mama Sita Alice. And and I know that, that even though he and I are coming to the last uh, uh, season of our, our ministry, we're not finished. I'm building a trust and he's building five churches for $1.2 billion. But he's not building those churches for himself. 
He'll never attend those churches for very long. Those churches, when they're built, they're being built for you and your children. Amen. I'm not building the Messiah. I don't get anything from the Messiah Trust. The Messiah get what is given to the Messiah Trust. Amen. And so a lot of what we do do not directly benefit us. If your neighbor is sick and, and they, 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 they have five kids and you know they've been in bed all day because they're sick, just cook them something, take it to them, feed those five children. God will bless you for that. Do you know that? He'll, he'll bless you for that. But money, the greedy, the man that loves money more than people, you can tell it. He, he, he probably could feed all the Messiah. There are people in this country that could feed every Messiah and, and they don't give a thing. Well, at one day he's going to come in to account with the man in which all of us will have to stand and give an account for everything that we do. Amen? Amen. Now, Rhonda read a, a, an incredible scripture in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 through 8. I hope you don't forget that scripture, but I'm going to keep going. I want you to turn to Philippians chapter 4 and verse 10 through 19. Philippians 4, 10 through 19, and I'm going to read it, Rhonda. They, I don't think they gave you a microphone, so let me just read it. It says, but rejoice, I say in the Lord greatly, that now at last your care for me has flourished again. This is... Uh, the, the Apostle Paul is talking about uh, he has a ministry that people weren't supporting financially. And uh, the Philippians, which of the 12 churches you find in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, it is, is one of the poorest churches. And God uses the poorest church. The rich churches weren't helping him, like the church at Ephesus, which had plenty of money. They didn't send him anything. It was the poor churches that have kept, kept him going. And he's, he's thanking them because they had an opportunity to bless him. He says, surely you do care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak uh, in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am in to be content. You see, this is one of the, the, the great benefits of being born again is that you can learn whether you have a lot of money or you have no money, you can learn to be content, realizing that God is going to take care of you. Now, I have watched men in America go from billionaire to nothing heir because they trusted their money rather than trusting in God. And I have watched also uh, here in Kenya, men who have nothing and, and, and you couldn't tell it. They have the joy of the Lord as their strength. They, they, they got to eat. They, they, their family is okay. They're, nobody's sick. Do you know how many people in this country that have multi, multiplied millions of dollars that would exchange their life for your life because their body is broken, they're sick, they're, they're, they're in trouble, and they would trade it all, all that money away just to have what you have, maybe to have the joy that you have, maybe to be able to smile again. The wealthiest people in, a, in any country, including Kenya, are not necessarily the happiest people. Amen? Do you, do you see that? Turn to your neighbor and say, are you one of the happy people? Amen. Now, he said, I know how to have nothing. I, I told the church over at Shiloh, I said one day, Rhonda looked at the checkbook and she said, Ron, what? Where did all the money go? I, I said, the Messiah. And, and she said, do you, do, you, do you realize we have nothing? I said, yes, but we have the blessing of God. Now, 
I'm not advocating that you give everything away. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that if you did, God will watch over you. He loves you. He's concerned about you. I don't think your government, I, listen, I, I'm, I don't, even though I'm probably Kenyan, they said I can get a citizenship and start voting and everything. I, I don't think your salvation is going to come from your government. I hope they do what they can do, but I, I, want, I, I don't want you to make the government your source and put so much pressure on the government because they ha- they, they're broke too. I, I think you should make Jesus the source for your life. And don't pray to Dr. Ruto. He, he, he's not going to answer it. He, he, he won't. But you can pray and ask Jesus. Say, Jesus, you know my condition. You know where I live. You know how much money I have. You know what I need. And I ask by faith that you take care of me. I have no one else to turn to. I realize that I, 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 I'm in a in a bad place. Maybe I, I, I didn't handle my money well or something has happened. I lost my job or whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, whatever the devil can throw at you. But I know that my Lord, Jesus, will never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never turn his back on me. And I believe that. I'm, I'm 60, almost 68 years old. And, and in my lifetime, he has never left me. I've been without. You'll never know it. I'll never look poor. I'll never, I'll never dress like the devil. People ought to look at you whether you're fasting and not even be able to tell you're fasting. Well, they shouldn't look at you and have pity on you. You know, some Kenyans dress poor because they want you to think they don't have anything because they think that that's going to get them more money or, or more sympathy. No, dress for success. Write that down in your notes. Say, I'm going to dress for success. You know, when a man looks for someone to hire, he does not look for a guy that has holes in his shoes and, 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 and dirty clothes. He looks for a man that he can trust with his, his business that looks like he does. So if you want to, to, to be a banker, dress like a banker. And if you notice, bankers, they don't overdress and they don't underdress. They dress in a way that you expect them to take care of your money the same way. You know, you don't want them to, you know what I'm saying, don't you? Some of you are looking at me like, I've never been in a bank. I don't know what you're saying. Now he says, I've learned to have little and I've learned to have much everywhere that's wherever you go and in all things i've learned to both be full and to be hungry both to abound and to suffer need i can do all things through christ who strengthens me you see that all i can do all things is related to your money whether you have the little or nothing whether you I don't understand that card. Mama signals me. She sends me sign sign language. And sometimes I don't understand it, but uh, where was I? I'm, I'm preaching. Oh. When, when you pray about your circumstances. Don't pray as if God is not involved. He doesn't know. There's nothing that you're going to tell him that he doesn't already know. Now, you can tell him and you can ask him. He says, ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. He, he's not wanting you to ask and keep on asking and never receive. That's not the way this works. But God knows where you are. How many of you here today have a financial 
issue that you're facing that looks impossible to you right now. If, if, if everything stays the same, it's impossible. Let me see your hand. I, I've got one. Does anybody else in this church have financial needs that you need a miracle breakthrough? Keep your hand raised. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that every hand raised, that you know the circumstance, you know what they need, and you know where the blessing is going to come from. And as they give today in the church, as they take care of God's business, I know that you're going to take care of their business. And what is a raised hand today is going to be a testimony tomorrow. For it's in the mighty, powerful name that is above every name a name that every, everyone living on this earth will bow and kneel before it's over. And it's the name of, as they say in Spain, Jesus Cristo. Now it says, uh, I can do all things. I want you to underline that in your Bible. But remember, it's not, it doesn't start with, I can do all things. It starts with, a man who has learned how to be content, not always worrying about money, not always complaining, not always griping. He just, look, he doesn't change a lot day for day. Now, you know, Boney and Rhonda will tell you that, you know, I, I, I don't, I, it, it's not in my nature to worry about money. I've lived too long. I know that, that there are times in everyone's life that they, they need God to help them. But I also know there are times when unexpected blessings call favor. Favor is unexpected blessings come from unexpected places. Do you realize that? Unexpected blessings come from unexpected blessings. And what, that's what God's wanting to do for you. But he needs you to stop complaining and start turning those complaints into faith and confession of, of scriptures that apply to the circumstances you're going through. And you watch what God does for you. Amen. You better, you, you, you better not be quiet when Bishop gets back. He, he is not going to put up with that. He's going to ask those of us, isn't he, Pastor David, he's going to ask, what did what you guys do to them? They, 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 don't even, they don't even smile anymore. You're going to get us in trouble. So you just put a big smile on your face. Even if you're broke, just smile. Act like you got a million. Just, just act, act, act like you got something. It says, nevertheless, you have done well in that you shared in my distress. When you see believers, if you have a little extra and you see a believer or, or like the Messiah, you see people that need your help, help them. Help them. Because when you need help, there will be somebody come along that can help you. This whole thing's connected. Give and it shall be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shake it together, running over, shall men pour into your bosom. It does not just fall off of trees. There are no money trees. Amen. Now you Philippians know also in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, and when you see Macedonia, you can underline it, just put poor. That's the poorest area of Greece. When I departed Macedonia, no church, not one church, participated with me in giving and receiving. Not one church. Can you imagine? Yes, I can because it's happened to me. I've preached in over 360 deliverance churches and many other churches besides. And sometimes I go to churches and they're so excited by the message and and the revival, they forget to give me anything. Not a penny. In fact, I've had a few pastors, I've preached my heart out for revival, and, and I know I can see what's in the bucket. I mean, it's not hidden. And then they ask me for money. 
Do you know a laborer is worthy of his hire? You don't go to work and, and, and do it for nothing. Even the pastors here deserve money, probably deserve a raise. I, maybe I'll put that in a conversation sometime with the bishop. But, but you, you go to work because you, you expect to be paid. Now, if they don't pay you, you don't stay long. Not in the church. Oh, the church expects that preachers, especially if they're white, are just made of money. Made of it. He doesn't need my money. Listen, it's not based on what I have that determines your giving. It's based on what you need. You know, Oral Roberts, uh, we t I, I tithed to him for many years. He said I was the biggest giver to him personally in, by, by any pastor. And I, I don't fear lack. I don't fear it. Do you fear it? Some of you fear it. No, fear God. Fear the one who has all that you need. How many of you need a job? If you need a job, raise your hand. I'm, I'm in the faith mood. Lift it up high. Don't look. People, every, every one of us in this room have needed a job at some time. Father, you see every hand raised. I pray that they get up every morning and they work every day. They put a resume together and they go out. They go out looking good and they go out expecting and that you're going to give them favor with someone that's going to be a blessing to them and that they're going to come home after, after searching. You say, seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened. I expect that in the next one month that we're going to be getting testimonies told back to this church on how God has given you a job better than you expected. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you see an attitude difference? Now, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm, I'm a Jesus preacher. I prosper in my soul. Money, money has little to do with whether I'm blessed or not. Do you know how sick I was? I, I, I know they, you've prayed for me here, didn't you, Pastor David? I, I had sepsis, which is a very deadly, it's, it's one of the most deadly diseases on the earth. I had it seven times in a year and a half. My sister had it one time, my baby sister, who I love very much, a letter to Christ. Her name was Diane. She had it one time for eight hours and died. It has killed tens of thousands of people in Kenya, and I have the privilege of having it seven times. And sometimes I've preached up here and don't even remember it because I had a high fever. But I refuse to give in even to sickness. My God is the, he's not just a physician, he's the great one. And if they can't fix it, he can. And I trust him. My job on this earth is not over. Therefore, God will do whatever is necessary to keep me going. And today I feel great in part because of your prayer. Don't I, pre am I preaching differently than I did last week over at, at Shiloh, I feel great. A year and a half of sickness. Doctors telling me I'm going to die. I did not die, but I live. And I declare the works of the Lord. And what is a benefit to me is a benefit to you. It's all promised to all of us. Tell your neighbor... I, he, he even looks better. Just go ahead and tell him. Dr. Ron looks better. It says, for even in Thessalonica, you sent aid to once and again to meet my necessities. Listen, I could be preaching at a church, let's say in Lodwar. They want me to come do a, a, a revival there. And I wouldn't be surprised if Bishop Jimmy helps me get there. Maybe the Lodwar church doesn't have the money. 
Maybe, maybe my home church takes care of me. I don't know. All I know is that God knows what is needed in your life. I, look, I'm looking at your face, and I want you to convince your face that your needs are going to be met. That means raise the corner of your mouth and smile and tell your neighbor, my needs will be met. I believe. I believe it. But today you get to buy me lunch. Go tell them that too. Not that I seek the gift. Listen, Paul was not after your money, and neither am I, frankly. I, if, if I have to beg, I, I don't want it. Paul was not trying to, he, in fact, he made tents. He, he lived with Simon the Tanner, and if you've ever smelled tanning, uh, when they're tanning hides, it is the worst smell, probably next to death itself, of a human. He's not seeking the gift. He's seeking what? I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. I'm not looking for the gift. I'm looking for the blessing you're going to get because you give something to me. You reap much more than what you gave me. So I'm not interested only in that, that money comes my way. I'm interested that you get much more than I do. I want to see everybody in this church blessed and highly favored. Pastor David, I, I pray often for you. I don't, I'm not sure what the connection is. Maybe sometime we can have lunch. I'll buy. But God has a great future for you. He, he's adjusting now. He's, you know, uh, uh, I, I can't get into the whole story, and this has nothing to do with my sermon, but it does have to do with this, what I'm saying to you. The Lord said that I was going to go through three very difficult circumstances that were going to cause me to stop trusting in certain things that I trusted in because I needed to trust him fully. And boy, I walked through three very hard circumstances and I began to learn that he is the source of my total supply. Say, the Lord is the source Look, say it like you mean it if you're going to say it. The Lord is the source of my total supply. Tell your neighbor, the Lord is the source of my total supply. Now, he put the church in your life, and he creates opportunities within the church like this, this giving program, $1.2 billion, you're going to need more than that, but that's, that's another subject. But he puts these needs in the, in the heart of the pastor so that we can, it, it gives us opportunity to give every week. If, if, you, if you were not in church, you would not be giving. And if you're not giving, you're not getting. So don't let the offering go by any time that you don't put the, your very best in it. Because God not only wants to build five churches and raise 1.2 billion, but he wants to multiply much more back into your life. And some of you, your dreams are connected to your giving. When you give, you open a, an account in heaven. And just at the time when you need a breakthrough, God brings it to you. Amen? Amen. Now, if, if you're a pro box giver, you're going to be a pro box receiver. But if you want a Mercedes, you're going to have to invest. Amen. I think I'm touching nerves today. Do, do you know the principle of go, sowing and reaping? What is, what, are, what is the principle of sowing and reaping? Look up on the, on the screen. Put up Mark 12, 41 through 44. Let's read it together. This, this 
if there is a scripture, this is one of my favorite because it will give you the key to not just giving. You think, that, oh, the preacher, he just wants my money. No, this preacher, and I know that Bishop Jimmy and, and Mama Sita feel the same way. We want you to be blessed. Let's read this together. Now Jesus sat opposite the treasury and saw how the people put money into the treasury. And many who were rich put in much. But you know what they were doing? They were not giving out of their need. They were giving out of their abundance. Do you know what I'm saying? Some of you have good jobs, get paid big money, and you don't even tithe. But there are people in this church, time is up. <laughs> that just means I get to continue this one day. But there are people in this church that sometimes what they have in their pocket won't meet the need that they have, so they just give it all. And God sees that. I really believe what I'm saying to you. When you take care of God's business, God is going to take care of your business. And what you have right now may not meet all your needs, but God notices. And when you just tip God, you give him a few bucks, and you're a wealthy person or you have, a, you have extra, God sees that as well. You know, you have men and women in this country that are filthy rich. And they don't give unless that somebody blows a trumpet and they get some credit for it. And some of you have been giving all your life. How many of you have been giving since you believed? And if somebody notices or doesn't notice that, you don't care. You just give, you give, you give, you give. Look, I, I'm, I'm going to challenge you. And I want all of you to hear me. Everybody bow your head for just a moment. I want the cameras on me so that they're not on the people because I don't want you to feel unnecessary pressure. But I want you to listen to me. I'm not up here teaching for my benefit. I'm up here teaching these principles of giving for your benefit. Now, if you do not tithe, maybe you haven't learned it yet, or maybe you think if you tithe, you're not going to have enough. But I'm here to tell you, and I think Bishop Jimmy would back me on this, that if you don't tithe, you will never have enough. So if you're not a tither, I want you to raise your hand just for a second. Raise it up. Say, I, I, I admit it. I'm... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to repent of it right now if you don't tithe. That's 10% of your total income. Lift it up high. Let me see it real quick. Pull it down. Nobody else is looking. They should be looking uh, in, in their own heart. But I see hands. R raise your hand. Some of you are not telling me the truth. That's, that's n certainly not going to help you. Yeah, there are hands all over this church. Now put your hands back down. I want to encourage the, the non-tithers to start on, if you don't have it today, I want you to start on your next paycheck. I want you to take 10% of that, put it aside, put it in an envelope, and I want you to bring it down, and I want you to, I want you to walk up to Bishop Jimmy, and I want you to say, this is my first tithe. I need your blessing. Now, everyone look at me. If you do what I say, or what I'm encouraging, I'm not, saying, I'm not telling you, I'm encouraging you. Next year this time, you're going to tell me about the breakthroughs you've had. You know, I've preached a lot in the slums. And do you remember we preached in, what's the name of the, um, uh, huh? Lamuru. We've preached, huh? Huh? I, you know, I, it, it, I preached in slum, and a man came up and gave everything he had in an offering, and he ran a store, and he said, my store is a, 
uh, a blanket with some fruits on it. And I, I, I've been doing this for a long time and I've never really had a breakthrough, but it meets my needs. And, but I'm, I'm trusting what you're saying is going to work. Then uh, the next month he came and he bought more. And more and more until finally he was bringing truckloads of things and stacking them at the altar. Now he has stores and warehouses. And he has his own home. And he has his own two cars. And all of this happened over a matter of about three years. Because he learned that God was his source and that his tithe was his seed. Are you with me? How many of you want this to breakthrough in your life. All right, let's close. Father, in the name of Jesus, thank you so much for visiting us this day. I thank you for hearing our hearts, hearing the cries that we have in the night. Lord, we don't want to be greedy. We, 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 we don't speak in regard to need all the time. Need, need, need. For we've learned in whatever state we are to be content. Teach us contentment. That life does not consist in the abundance of the things that you possess. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people that Rhonda and I have, are, are learning to love. And I thank you, God, that in the future, we're going to hear stories that will inspire givers. I bind the spirit of poverty. I break the curse of poverty that's been in some families for generations. I break that curse in Jesus' name. And I thank you that the future is bright. In Jesus' name, with every head bowed and every eye closed, if you came here this morning, I'm usually the morning crowd is, is mostly uh, uh, people that attend the church, but if you're here today and Jesus is not Lord of your life, that means that you are not serving him with all of your heart. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you. Is there anyone here today that Jesus is not the Lord of your life? Or that you've backslidden. Maybe you started out as a Christian, but you have let sin into your heart and you need to, you need to get that broken right now so that you can be on your way uh, to better things. I want you to lift up your hand so we can pray. Anyone here? I'm going to look one time around the room. If you're here and things are not right between you and God, you may have, be, have the reputation of being the most spiritual person in this church, but if you're not right with God, your heart tells you that. Lift your hand in Jesus' name. It looks like everyone is a believer. Pastor Edward, would you come now? This... This man is my friend and I love him. Would you give him a hand real quick?